Tonight, World Series Championship. For St. Louis, it provided a booster shot of civic pride. But almost before the fireworks had faded, the countdown to next season had begun. Could the world champion Cardinals turn the celebration of 82 into the instant replay of 83? The Redbirds have never won back-to-back -back World Series. The last time they had a shot at a repeat performance was in 1968. After defeating the Red Sox in 67, the Cardinals took a 3-1 lead over the Tigers, only to lose the last three games of the 68 series. Now, Whitey Herzog's team has a chance to make Cardinal baseball history. Now they face the challenge of keeping the crown so that the Cardinals and St. Louis might relive that world-class moment. Keeping the Crown is sponsored in part by... One Cardinal has said he was more emotionally moved by the parade through downtown St. Louis than he had been by the final out in the World Series. It was a very exclusive party, just 300,000 intimate friends, give or take 50,000. Sociologists tell us that the impact of big-time professional sports on our society is not always positive. Yet there can be no doubt that the Cardinals' World Championship and the subsequent street-side love-in galvanized our community as no other single event possibly could have. At least for a few days, or a few hours, lines of age, race, and social status were blended into a homogenous sea of Cardinal Red. For once, we stopped to consider our common bond, rather than the divergent forces which pull us apart. And there were other, more material rewards. The National League Championship and the World Series pumped untold millions of dollars into the St. Louis economy. Many downtown restaurants and bars reported a 90% increase in business. One hotel enjoyed a $200,000 windfall directly attributable to baseball. Further, it was a politician's dream. Mayor Vince Shamel never before enjoyed such a receptive constituency. Mr. Mayor, there was a report in Milwaukee that Milwaukee Brewer fans are bigger fans than Cardinal fans. By the way, did you have a wager with the fine mayor of Milwaukee? I, I had a wager with the mayor of Milwaukee. He had the advantage in the bet, though. I was putting up a case of Budweiser, and, and he was putting up a case of something they make up there. Just had a chance to uh, check with one of our beer distributors. They said during this playoff and World Series, they sold four times their normal devices. So I'm going to think that uh, perhaps the uh, chills are jingling around. We're going to make a few bucks, you think? I think this has been good for the city. Cardinals, 
more than anything else, so I think the fans of this city have been great for this city. So when is the party going to end, man? Right? You know, it's really hard to describe the way it was, but, uh, you know, I think it's time to put that behind us and get on with 1983. Well, at what point were you able to do that? At what point did the afterglow from the series wear off and did you start thinking about 1983? I didn't start thinking about it until March 1st. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we enjoyed it to the fullest, and um, you know, I don't think that we've gotten the due recognition that a lot of other teams get after they win the World Series or whatever. But uh, I guess that's just the way it is. You mentioned lack of attention from the media. I don't seem to see St. Louis Cardinals on national advertisements the way I have off World Championship teams in the past. Now, is that because nobody asked, or because you didn't want to do it? <laughs> I think you said it the first time. <laughs> I don't think anybody would ask. I, I, I didn't get any, uh, any any offers whatsoever. I don't know if I was a businessman and I had some product to sell, and I had an Ozzy Smith or Bruce Souter or Lonnie, anybody but Joaquin, I would. <laughs> Baseball star Jim Palmer. I hate Dan. Introduced and reintroduced to the anatomical parts of former world champions like Jim Palmer's flaky scalp. Looking good. And Reggie Jackson's gap tooth smile. But the current world champs have largely been left out in the commercial cold. I'm talking to Ozzy Smith. A handful of Redbirds have been enlisted to extol the virtues of local products, but that's small potatoes compared to the mega bucks Madison Avenue doles out for national campaigns. The prevailing theory about why the Cardinals have been snubbed is that as a Midwestern team, they don't appeal to consumers in the nation's population centers on both coasts. That hypothesis was supported by the scene at a recent exhibition game in Florida between the Cardinals and the Phillies. The Phils, who last won a championship in 1980 and are now composed of baseball moldy oldies, were besieged by scribes carrying notebooks and minicams but the reigning world champions were virtually ignored by the attending media. Of course, that relative anonymity carries with it certain advantages. There is an unchanging, immutable quality about spring training that is at once comforting and monotonous. The players get tired of hearing the same questions, and the media gets tired of hearing the same answers. You get answers like, we take them one game at a time, we take them one day at a time, you have to give them credit, they came to play, you hear all of those. I thought the team played very well. I, I try hard for the, the hometown team. I did my best. I play hard every day and give 100%. Can you tell me exactly what 110% is? It's more than 105. Uh, I'm not sure that's more than 100, though. Of course, if the players' answers are frequently predictable and unimaginative, it could be because the questions are not always of Pulitzer Prize-winning caliber. So after the series, after we won it, I must have had 30 reporters come up to me one at a time and ask me, how did I feel? How's your arm feel? How are you in shape? And how's your wife and kids? Do you think you're going to win it again? Are there any particular spring training questions that you get from the media that really drive you up the wall? Uh, the one you, you said the first time. <laughs> Do people make undue demands on you? There's a lot of cases. People are basically, uh, you know, they're real good about it. <laughs> they, they, they want an autograph. Kids are excited. I remember when I was a kid, but uh, there's certain times we have to, to have to do our work. And uh, like the thing that particularly bothers me is that we're entitled to our bad moods too. And it's just, just like you said. You know, you have your bad days. Uh, a lot of days, uh, I don't particularly like signing autographs, uh, except when I'm not uh, playing. You know, then I'll, I'll sign as many as I can. I think we have the type of guys around here that don't mind doing it, but you have to catch them at the right time. You know, timing is very important. It's just like when kids come to the ballpark to ask for autographs, there's a certain time for that. You know, sometimes we're going out on the field and, and we're getting loose. And that, to me, is not the right time to ask the guy to come over and sign an autograph. Now, you know, maybe if I'm on my way in or, uh, you know, if I'm just sitting around or something, then we, we don't mind doing that. But uh, it's just like doing interviews and, and stuff just before we go on the field. Or just before you get on the bus. <laughs> At no other time are players and fans thrust together as closely as they are during spring training. Let's face it, while baseball demands unfailing reflexes and exquisite individual skills, a player's daily workload is not physically taxing. That leaves plenty of time and energy for mingling with the paying customers. 
While the fundamental annual attraction of spring training is simply the warm sunshine and easy ambiance, there is no doubt that last fall's World Series triumph has created record fan interest at the Cardinals camp in St. Petersburg. Attendance at exhibition games is at an all-time high. Hundreds of St. Louisans have made a pilgrimage to Florida for the rites of spring, many of them taking advantage of special tour packages. Former Cardinal player Joe Horner has been organizing such tours for the past six years. We've got about 100 people down here this year, which is putting a double to last year. They are real die-hard Cardinal baseball fans. Uh, and that's what they're down here for, to watch baseball. It's baseball all the way. We come down uh, uh, every, every year at this time. Almost a religious group. Yes, I've been here four years now. The devotion of many of these fans to their beloved Cardinals seemingly knows no bounds. This woman has diligently kept a handwritten journal that reflects the outcome of every game the Cardinals have played for the past 21 years. It goes. Rained out, World Series, the player signatures, and then runs, yeah, any highlights, and that's it. So I think it's going to be good this year. Even stadium vendors have plenty to sing about this spring, and practically any item with the Cardinal logo on it is a very marketable commodity. What's the hottest selling item? The caps. The caps go. We had the world champion caps, you know, it said on 1982 world champions on the top, and then these shirts. We had these shirts. We just got them in again today. We sold uh, at least 12 dozen when we had them. Well, you're out of the world championship hats? Yes. When are you going to get a new shipment in? We're, we're expecting them any day now. Will you hold one for me? Sure. Dorel Norman Whitey Herzog, age 51, nicknamed the White Rat for his baseball savvy, recently elevated to genius status by the national sports media. To his everlasting credit, Whitey snorts at that genius tag, explaining that in baseball, a genius is any manager who has the luxury of a great bullpen. What with all the hoopla about Whitey ball and the like, it's a cinch that Whitey Herzog gets his due as a tactician and a strategist. What people fail to realize, though, is that Whitey Herzog is successful largely because he's a good people manager. This will be my 10th year managing, and uh, I've been fired twice, so I know this. Uh, when you win, uh, they say you communicate and you can really handle people, and when the club starts losing, somebody gets hurt, they say you're too tough, too easy, or can't communicate. So I don't worry about things like that. I'm just happy that uh, my players feel that way. Uh, I appreciate that, but by the same token, I think it's because i got a pretty good bunch of people. While last October marked Whitey's first managerial appearance in a World Series, he has been remarkably successful at winning divisional championships. His Kansas City Royals captured three straight American League West titles in 1976 through 78. Interestingly, Whitey still insists that his Cardinals were the de facto champs in the National League East in 1981. That was the year when baseball's strike-created split season prevented the Cards from participating in the playoffs even though the Redbirds had the best overall record in the National League East. I think really our first one was the 81. Uh, we went through it in 81. I think some of the young players played good and under pressure that year, and uh, it made it a little bit easier last year. But uh, I don't think unless you're really a baseball player or maybe uh, just an athlete in professional sports that you realize the extreme pressure you have in the stretch run and from the middle of August till October in baseball. and. And uh, it's amazing how you're going to get uptight. You don't really do the things you do best. So it got you there. And uh, until you do it one time, it's a little tough. That's just like if you look at the pro golfer. Until he's won a professional tournament, it's just tough for him to go out that last day and really play. And uh, that's just the way professional teams are. Few teams in any sport are more professional than the St. Louis Cardinals. Here's the club that Whitey built, the defending world champions. The statistics shown on the baseball cards first reflect a player's performance during the 1982 regular season, followed by that same player's stats from last fall's World Series. First baseman Keith Hernandez now has plenty of gold-gloved company in the Cardinal infield, but with more than seven years of big league experience, Hernandez remains the leader of one of baseball's stingiest infields. In 1982, Hernandez failed for the first time in four years to hit at least 300, not that Keith fell very far, he posted a 299 average and led the team in game-winning RBIs. At 29, Hernandez personifies the day-to-day -day consistency that has become the Cardinal trademark. We have a very sound, fundamentally strong club. We don't make mistakes in the field. Mark Belanger, who's 
said something on Sporting News that it was a pleasure to watch us play because it it's the first team he's seen in years where there everybody's in the right spot at the right time. And uh, those are things that win your ball games. They were a very well-disciplined club. Which National League second baseman has committed the fewest errors over the past two seasons? Manny Trio? Nope. Bill Garner? Uh-uh. The most consistent second sacker in the National League has been 26-year-old Tom Hur of the Cardinals, who has mishandled only 14 chances in two seasons as a starter. That statistic, however, has been one of baseball's best-kept secrets. I don't think I received a, a vote in the, in the gold glove balloting, which is a joke as far as I'm concerned. However, the condition of Hur's legs is no joke. Tom underwent off-season surgery to remove damaged cartilage in his right knee. That leg responded well, but in late March, torn cartilage in his left knee prompted further arthroscopic surgery. Until her is physically sound, the starting second baseman job will belong to 29-year-old Mike Ramsey. It is no exaggeration to say that last year's world championship could not have been captured without Ramsey's contribution. Mike started more than 30 games at second while Hur was ailing early last season. Later, when Ozzie Smith was forced out of action with a leg injury during September's stretch drive, Ramsey stepped in at short and played almost flawless baseball. Seemingly whenever and wherever the need arises, Ramsey delivers. I don't want anybody to get hurt, uh, Tommy or Ozzie or Kenny or anybody, because, uh, you know, let's, let's face it, we need those guys, and uh, they're, they're the starters, and that's the way, it's, that's the way it is. Uh, you know, it, it's it's fun to play though. Like last year, I played second for about a month, and I had a good time, and it was it's a lot of fun. It's uh, you know, it's a pleasure to watch these guys play, but it's even more of a pleasure to be out there with them. Will Rogers said he never met a man he didn't like. If Will were alive today, he might amend that to read he never met a man or woman who didn't like Ozzie Smith. Ozzie is almost universally revered by fans, teammates, and opponents alike. An almost unheard of accomplishment in this age of public cynicism and rampant professional jealousy. During the off-season, Ozzie signed a new contract worth more than $1 million a year, making him the highest-paid shortstop in the history of baseball. But typically, Ozzie handled the resulting publicity as deftly as he makes a backhanded stab in the hole. Uh, you know, if I'm a fan, I'm going to the ballpark to, to see an exciting ball game. I'm not going because a guy makes a million dollars or a guy makes two million dollars. I want to be able to go out and enjoy a good baseball game and not worry about salaries that, uh, that the guys make. It is valid, of course, to question whether an athlete or anyone else is really worth a million dollars a year. But by today's inflated standards, Ozzie might be a bargain at twice the price. A growing number of baseball people think he could be the best glove man ever. People that get a chance to see me play every day may say that I'm the greatest that they've ever seen, and people that get to see somebody else play may say that he's the greatest that they've ever seen. And, you know, that's, it's, that's what it boils down to, it's just a matter of personal opinion. Third baseman Ken Obrickfell understands perhaps better than any other Cardinal how much last fall's World Series victory meant to St. Louis. Ken was born in nearby Highland, Illinois, went to high school in Collinsville, has been a Cardinal fan all his life, and has spent his entire professional career in the Redbird organization. And yet there was a point last season when Obergfell was struggling at the plate, when he feared the happy marriage between ball player and ball club might be on the rocks. Anything can happen as far as baseball, and you know, I would, there's always it's a possibility you can get traded, but uh, the trade never happened, and now I just want to go out there and prove to myself and prove to the people of St. Louis that I still have a pretty good ball player and can uh, come back from the year I had last year. Back when he was with the Yankees, Reggie Jackson once said that he was the team's catalyst, the straw that stirs the drink. Well, on the Cardinals, Lonnie Smith is the fuse that ignites the explosion. In 1982, Lonnie led the cards in batting average, run scored, doubles, triples, and stolen bases. Ricky Henderson of the A's may be baseball's best base thief statistically, but Lonnie doesn't concede a thing to his American League counterpart. I would love to have the chance or the opportunity, you know, to do like Ricky Henderson did. You know, any time he got on base, he was going. But I have to control myself on the bases at times because of the game, the situations, and uh, just the way I'm performing at the time. If I'm swinging good, I feel good, I run well. If I'm not swinging well, I'm not running as well because uh, I'm just not getting as loose as good. So. Mm -hmm. uh, 
someday maybe I'll attempt it. So, you know, but right now I just want to play with along with the team and win games. In a sport which usually emphasizes concentration and consistency rather than unbridled emotion, Smith's competitive fire burns hotter than most. Lonnie will never forget that Philadelphia traded him in 1981. I want to play every game possible against uh, the Phillies. And uh, also I want to play against the Expos and the Reds because I played so bad against them last year. But I know we have a lot of talent on this team, especially in our field. And I'm willing to sacrifice some of my playing time to get the other guys. Just as Cardinal fans are sure that Lonnie Smith should rightfully have been voted the National League's most valuable player in 1982, they are equally adamant that Redbird first-year outfielder Willie McGee actually had better credentials than did Rookie of the Year Steve Sachs of the Dodgers. Few major leaguers have ever enjoyed a more auspicious rookie season. McGee instantly became a favorite of Cardinal fans as much for his unspoiled demeanor as for his spectacular talents. I like to keep things simple and just, you know, just concentrate on baseball. I'm not a spokesman, you know, and I'm not a very good talker. And I'm good at baseball, and that's what I want to, you know, keep my mind on. Which of the questions that bother you the most, and which are the most repetitive? The most frequently heard is about the sophomore jinx. And uh, I don't believe in it. I believe that if, you know, if you, if you just concentrate on baseball and work hard and just can avoid that type of situation, then you know, you won't think about it because I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about it until I got here and then people, you know, like I said, ask you that question. And then the more they ask you, you know, the more it, it stays in the back of your mind. Right field is one of the Cardinals' few question marks for 1983. Not because of an absence of talent, but because of an abundance. Incumbent George Hendrick drove in a club high 104 runs in 1982 and led the team in homers with 19. But Hendrick is being pushed by the enormously talented David Green, a 22-year-old speedster from Nicaragua, whom some have labeled the next Roberto Clemente. Green, of course, would rather be known as the current David Green. Figuring out a way to get Green into the lineup more frequently has been a top priority for Whitey Herzog this spring. Hendrick has frequently worked out at first base as a possible backup to Keith Hernandez. At the same time, the club has considered trading Hendrick while his market value is still high. At 33, Silent George remains a much misunderstood individual. In point of fact, his policy of not granting interviews to reporters has generated more publicity for him than he could ever have scared up by talking. But there is no doubting the sincerity of Hendrick's convictions. He is perhaps the most respected player in the Cardinal clubhouse. His patience with children is exemplary and he is anything but quiet around his teammates. They got on camera, George, they got you. 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 Chuck, they last night. If the 82 series was a landmark triumph for the Cardinal organization and the city of St. Louis, it was a dramatic personal breakthrough for Cardinal catcher Daryl Porter. Forsaken by many Redbird fans while he struggled through a difficult regular season, What'd you jump for? <laughs> Porter was nothing short of magnificent in winning most valuable player honors in both the National League playoffs and the World Series. Catcher Darrell Porter. Porter is optimistic that his postseason role in 1982 will carry over into 83, but success has never come easily for Darrell Porter. Back at my, my real successful seasons, and, and the one thing that, that really I think sticks in, in my mind more than anything else is how hard it was during those, uh, even those good years, how hard it was to come out here every day and, and really dedicate yourself to the game. This is a game that can leave you so fast. I mean, you take a couple of days off of batting practice, you've lost all the things that you've worked on. Now it's a, uh, you're starting all over again. It's just something that you have to go out every day and concentrate 100% on, and that's really, the really Both duties be. Relievers Jeff Lottie and Jeff Keener added depth and versatility to the Cardinal bullpen in 1982. Outfielders Dane Orge, Gene Roof, and Tito Landrum always seemed to answer the bell. Orge, you'll recall, tied a World Series record for most hits by a designated hitter in the 82 Fall Classic. And who can forget reserve catcher Glenn Brummer's dramatic steal of home plate to give the Cards a big win over the Giants last August. This year, the Redbirds have acquired another resourceful, if relatively unheralded, player. Utility man Jamie Quirk was picked up as a free agent from Kansas City last January. From day one in the major leagues, I was a pinch hitter. I had never had an everyday spot anywhere, and uh, you're always used uh, in a certain situation to pinch hit, and you just become accustomed to it. I, I look at it like a relief pitcher. You know when you get in there, 
it's going to be on the line. And, and it, either you do or you don't. You, you can't say anything about it. Either you come out smelling like a rose or you're to go to the game. Well, we won with 25 players last year stuck together. And you know, the other guys that are on clubs here, I know that you guys want to run advance saying, well, I should be playing more and I'm better than so-and-so. And it was none of that last year. And so guys come down here with the idea that there's only one or two spots open on the roster for the, uh, among four people. There's four people fighting for two jobs. As you would expect from a defending world champion, the Cardinals go into the 1983 season virtually with a pat hand. In fact, so set is the Cardinal roster that there probably won't be room for even the most talented rookie prospect. 22-year-old outfielder Andy Van Slyke comes complete with a can't-miss label. The Cards' first-round draft choice in 1979, Van Slyke has made steady progress through the Redbird organization and last year tore up double-A pitching with the Arkansas Travelers of the Texas League. At 6'1 and 190 pounds, Van Slyke can hit with power, and he possesses so much speed that he led the Texas League in stolen bases in 1982. Such great expectations have proved to be too heavy a burden for many young prospects, but Van Slyke seems genuinely unfazed. I know it's something that I enjoy. I, I'm, I'm glad that they, they feel that way, and uh, I feel that I can, I can play the outfield for uh, St. Louis Cardinals, and uh, given the chance, uh, I hope I can prove myself. Training in the same camp with such outfield luminaries as Smith, McGee, Hendrick, and Green could easily throw a 22-year-old rookie off stride. But here again, Andy just doesn't scare easily. I'm not really intimidated. They, uh, I mean, they do all the things that the minor league ball players do, but uh, with fewer mistakes. And uh, and I'm not intimidated at all. I just, I'm learning a heck of a lot more than I've probably learned in the past couple of years in baseball. And, uh, and and that's what all, you know, this game's all about. You can learn something new every day. Van Slyke will likely open the season with the Cards AAA Farm Club in Louisville, but someday soon, perhaps before the end of the coming campaign. Andy Van Slyke will be running down fly balls and hitting liners in the gap at Bush Stadium. At the other end of the experience scale is 44-year-old veteran left-hander Jim Cott, whose 23-year big league career has now spanned portions of four decades. When Jim Cott began his major league career in 1959, Ike was president and the United States had not yet put a man into space. Since that time, Cott has pitched for six big league clubs and has logged 4,493 innings on the mound. Now, however, Cott is frequently called upon to throw just a third of an inning per appearance. His job, come out of the pen with runners on base and get one big out. It is tough. I mean, it's the kind of thing that when you come in and you throw two or three pitches and uh, you get one hitter out, everybody says, well, that looks like an easy job. You just go in there and throw a few pitches. But when you go out there a couple times and you give up a key hit, then uh, it begins to add a little pressure because you know when at the start of the ball game you're going to get one chance to do your job. Between Cott and pitching coach Hub Kittle, the Cardinals have a wealth of pitching know-how unmatched by any other team in baseball. Hub, you see, still has the right to call Cott a youngster. Now 65, Hub is still doing what he knows and loves best at an age when many of his contemporaries have only memories. There is no generation gap between pedagogue and pupil on the Cardinal pitching staff. No, a key. A key. Going in. in fact, Kittle is at his best with young pitchers, whether it's by conversing with Spanish-speaking players in their native tongue, or just understanding the problems of youth. All these young fellas here have worked so hard to get where they are. They've been through the mill. They've been in A ball, rookie ball, double A, triple A ball. And all of a sudden, uh, he has the talent, and now he's played long enough that he can still play. He can play up here, too. So don't let the pressure get you just because you're up here. Yeah? Don't let that happen to you. You go out there between those white lines, and you be yourself. To date, Kittle's most ringing success has been his role in the development of Cardinal right-hander Joaquin Andahar. It was Kittle who discovered Andahar in Joaquin's native Dominican Republic in the late 60s. When Andahar and Kittle were reunited in St. Louis in 1981, the conditions were right for Joaquin to realize his sizable potential as a pitcher. In 1982, Andahar won 15 games and posted a minuscule ERA of only 2.47. 
<laughs> Andahar is the butt of almost every practical joke perpetrated in the Cardinal Clubhouse. This spring, when Joaquin's teammates weren't scaring him half to death with rubber snakes, they were hanging his glove out of a 10th floor window. Today, John Henry said, are you looking for your glove? I said, yes. And he said, okay, follow me. I follow him outside the stadium, you know. And we live close to the stadium, you know. I saw my glove hanging on the 10th floor in the hotel, you know. <laughs> and by that time, by this time, it might be real wet. Andohar's teammates kid him incessantly about taking all the credit for last year's championship. But actually, they know as well as anyone that Joaquin is a team man with a large helping of humility. You know, you have to be satisfied with whatever the God gives to you, you know, because a lot of people, they want to play baseball like you, and you can play, you know. You have the microphone now in your hand. You, know? <laughs> you got it. I have to be a proud of my job, you know, you have to be proud of your job, you know, and that's why, you know, I, I just another human. Professional is the most accurate adjective to describe 33-year-old Redbird right-hander Bob Forsh. His 15 victories in 1982 tied Andahar for the club lead in that department. Forsh's biggest virtue is his consistency. Now entering his ninth full season with the Redbirds, Bob can almost always be counted on to keep his team in the ball game going into the late innings. Well, when I first came up, you know, I basically threw a fastball and a curveball, and that was it. And uh, over the years, I made a transition when the fastball uh, isn't quite there. Then I work, you know, now I throw a slider and a little dead fish, which is more or less change up and uh, still got a curveball and fastball's got better movement on it. While Forsh and Andahar have a total of 15 years major league experience between them, the Cards' other two holdover starters from 1982 are very talented but very young. 23-year-old Dave LaPointe is the club's only certain left-handed starter. Many of LaPointe's nine victories last season came in crucial ball games. In fact, LaPointe was the winning hurdler the night the Cards clinched the National League East crown in Montreal. Clearly, whatever LaPointe lacks in experience, he makes up for in composure. For me, I'm not a, a person that really bothers with pressure too much. The only pressure is what you put on yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I just like to go out there and pitch. I don't look who's bad, and I just look at Daryl's glove and get in my own little bubble and go out there and do my job. So. You know, I don't care if it's the Pirates or the Phillies or somebody like that. I'm going to pitch the same no matter who's batting against me. So, it, you know, I, it was nice pitching down the stretch and clinching that game in Montreal, but this is a different year. You know, they got some different players on these teams that I'm going to have to deal with, and, you know, hopefully we'll have the same kind of luck. Right-hander John Stuper has appeared in only 23 games in his Major League career. But like LaPointe, the preponderance of those outings has come in pressure-packed situations. Stuper was widely hailed for his performance in Game 6 of the World Series when he pitched the cards to a 13-to-1 cakewalk. But the adulation seemed to embarrass Stuper, who treats his older teammates with deference in the Cardinal clubhouse. John knows that he'll ultimately be judged over the long haul, not for what he did on one October night in 1982. Anybody can be a great guy and, and friendly and everything when things are going well. It's, uh, I think it's, a, it's really a judgment of the kind of person you are when you can be that way and it, you know, keep on an even keel. Jim Cott really helps me in that manner because he's the same way if he gets hit around or if he pitches three or four shutout innings, and I'm gradually getting to that point. The cards go into the 83 campaign without an established fifth starter, but Whitey Herzog's certainly not losing any sleep. 